Tonight, RCMP are investigating a sexual assault overnight at the Country Thunder campground. The province and the feds may avoid a courtroom over the continuing fight over the carbon tax. Three cheers. And for more than 100 years, Indigenous baseball players have made an impact on and off the diamond. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It's Friday, July 12th, and welcome to the CBC Saskatchewan News. Hello everyone, I'm Dan Plaster. Country Thunder starts tonight and many revelers have been looking forward to a fun-filled weekend. But overnight, a woman was sexually assaulted at the campground. Now police are investigating and partiers are being told to stay safe. Shlok Talati has more. RCMP say they were called to the festival's campgrounds at about 3 a.m. this morning. They say a woman told them she was walking between campsites when a man came up to her and sexually assaulted her. She told the police that man was a stranger. He has not been located and now Lumsden RCMP are asking anyone with information to come forward. Police say the sheer number of people at this weekend's festival pose a challenge for security. When we have potentially 25,000 people that are gathered in an area, it's very difficult to manage everything that's happening. Certainly we don't want to see anything like that happen, so uh, we do our best to, to be visible and to take all complaints seriously and, that, and make sure we're investigating it you know, to the nth degree. Still, when asked about boots on the ground, the RCMP says it has adequate resources. Many people we've spoken to say they have felt safe here so far. That includes first-time festival goers. I think it feels really secure actually. You see police everywhere. I haven't felt unsafe a single time. I find the campsites are a little weird laid out. They're kind of, they're all packed together of course because there's so many people, but I wish that they were flagged a little better, like easier to find, that would be nice. RCMP say there were no sexual assault reports during last year's event. And in light of this incident, they say campers should be vigilant about their own safety on site. Riley Layton agrees. She's been here every year for the last six years. I always just say, like, have a buddy with you. Like, it's always good to just have even one person with you, no matter what. Um, but just, yeah, have fun, connect with everybody, and enjoy the music, because that's what we're all here for. The three-day fest has kicked off today, and it runs until Sunday. Most people we talked to have been here since Wednesday. RCMP say their officers are in place, but core security tasks are being handled by the organizers. Country Thunder refused to comment on the incident. Shlok Talati, CBC News, Craven. The legal battle over carbon tax money took another twist today. The provincial government went to court against the federal government fighting for a permanent injunction. But that hearing was abruptly adjourned. Alexander Kwan has the details. A high-profile legal battle between Saskatchewan and Ottawa may be solved away from the courtroom. Last week, Saskatchewan filed a lawsuit in federal court attempting to stop the CRA from taking millions of dollars it believes the province owes for failing to collect and remit part of the carbon tax. Earlier this year, Premier Scott Moe announced the province would no longer be collecting the carbon tax on natural gas used to heat homes. It was in response to the federal government exempting home heating oil from the carbon tax. Mo says that's unfair for provinces like Saskatchewan that primarily use natural gas. But the federal government wants its money. So last month, the CRA ordered Saskatchewan to give the money back. That prompted a lawsuit, with Minister Bronwyn Eyre arguing the CRA's decision is unconstitutional and unfair. And although the lawsuit is for $28 million, the real bill could be much higher, as high as $56 million, according to court documents. This morning, the two sides were set to appear in court, with the province asking for a permanent injunction against the CRA to stop them from garnishing any money. But the hearing was cancelled. It now appears the two sides are in negotiations that could resolve the current dispute. If a resolution isn't reached by Monday, the court hearing could be rescheduled for some time next week. Alexander Kwan, CBC News, Regina. There are about 85 active wildfires burning right now in the province. That's up from 77 this morning. So things are changing rapidly. 
One fire is about 16 kilometers away from the community of English River. People are ready to leave their homes if necessary. Last year we left, we, we evacuated people because of long smoke, high levels of smoke. But in the interim, we have purchased um, a lot of air purifiers for those with chronic health conditions. That has made a big difference. They're able to stay in their home without have, experiencing any health, health issues because of the smoke. Another fire is burning out of control near the communities of Creighton and Denaire Beach. The mayor says while things are smoky, the community is not under direct threat yet. The town has opened a fresh air center at the Sportex Arena for the vulnerable people with respiratory issues. And people are ready to leave on short notice if needed. Several arts and culture organizations are getting $30 million in provincial money. Those include the Western Development Museum, Wanuskewin Heritage Park, and the Saskatchewan Science Centre, as well as many others. Wanuskewin Heritage Park is on the road to becoming a UNESCO World Heritage designation. And it is hoped the money will help the centre continue telling stories of First Nations communities for years to come. Wanuskewin is open year-round, however, throughout the summer we feature daily drop-in programs, dance performances, and even tours out to see our bison herd. Our bison herd, which has grown uh, from just six in 2019 to 43 in 2024. Other groups getting a boost of government cash include the Windscape Kite Festival in Swift Current, the Regina Folk Festival, and Shakespeare on Saskatchewan. If you want to get outdoorsy this weekend, you know what? How about going fishing? And it just happens to be free fishing weekend. That means anglers do not need a license to go fishing tomorrow and Sunday. There are more than 100,000 fishable lakes around the province to choose from. Now, the usual rules and limits still apply. Fishing expert Jason Mattity says be sure to bring a cooler and ice if you hope to catch a fish for dinner. But if you catch a big one, he says, please release it. Those fish carry a lot of eggs, high reproductive capacity, and more evidence is coming to light that bigger fish teach little fish where to go eat, where to go for cover. Uh, they're, they're, the, they're really the elders of the fish community in every way. So uh, once you start removing those big fish, you don't have big trophy fish anymore. You have less fish because the smaller ones don't have as good of egg carrying capacity. Mattity says fishing is also great for mental health because people can get out, disconnect from their devices, and of course enjoy nature. There is another free fishing weekend in February for those who like to ice fish. A beautiful day by the river in Saskatoon. It sets up for a very nice weekend for Jazz Fest in that city as dozens of artists are ready to hit the stages all over the city. Tyreek Reed will give us the weather rundown on what things will look like for Saskatoon and the rest of the province. That's after the break. Welcome back. Hockey history was made last week when the Seattle Kraken named Jessica Campbell to their coaching staff. She is the first woman to be on the bench as an NHL assistant coach. Campbell, who hails from Rokenville, says her whole career has prepped her for this moment. I grew up playing boys hockey and then, you know, as a result of having different pathways, I was went into the women's game or the girls game, I think at age 15. And so it's just... You know, looking back on, I was raised in a locker room with a bunch of boys and I never thought anything different and I never really saw myself any different than just a player in the locker room and I was I was treated the same way. And so, you know, I credit my minor league coach, Leo Parker, who, who treated me as just one of the boys and I think he instilled a, a belief in me at a young age that I could do anything that they were doing and, and I think it led me to this this point today but the women's game is an incredible game it's fast it's it's a special game and at the end of the day we're all speaking hockey the language of hockey and now in the position that I am I can look back on my path and and connect a lot of dots from playing with the boys and it's it's an exciting feeling and ultimately at the end of the day a coach is is just meant to serve the player and guide the player and the needs of the player and I, I really try to just focus on 
the impact of my coaching and the relationships and establishing trust and strong communication with the guys. And really at the end of the day, I think they can feel that I care about their success. I want to get in the trenches with them and get to work to help them unlock every potential that they have um, yet to tap into. And so it's all the same at the end of the day. It is a West Division showdown Saturday night in Vancouver as the undefeated Rough Riders take on the BC Lions to battle it out for first place. The Riders come in with the top defense in the CFL. They have been especially stingy against the run, giving up a paltry 46 yards per game, which is best in the CFL. Now, BC may have the cure for their run defense, and that's the league's leading rusher, William Standback. Uh, he's a strong back, obviously a decorated background, and they've been doing a good job with him. I know he doesn't get probably as much love as he should get. He's doing a good job for them. Uh, he's good in protections as well. Uh, can catch it out of the backfield, so he, he can do a little bit of everything. You know, uh, predominantly they had, uh, you know, Mizell was last year was a more scatty back, and it had the butlers of the world. So, uh, you know, the stand back adds something uh, to the fold, and, you know, they got a, a dynamic offense, and, uh, you know, it's, you can't fall asleep on a guy like William Stanback. It's a 5 p.m. kickoff in Vancouver, and with the win, the Riders will be 5-0 for the first time since their Grey Cup winning season in 2013. The weather update is brought to you by Capital Ford Lincoln, proud partner of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Tariq reads in with weather and Tariq, uh, it's funny how even today with how warm it was still felt cool as compared to earlier this week. Yeah, I know. Of course, earlier this week, we were really met with that heat. Yesterday was the hottest day in many places in South and Central Saskatchewan. So we saw some records broken. Cornac saw a daytime high of 36.4 degrees yesterday, breaking the previous record of 36.1 that was set in 1968. Our friends in Assiniboia and Hudson Bay both broke records that were set in 2021. So it was a very hot day yesterday yesterday in South and Central Saskatchewan. Today, we're not really feeling extreme heat warnings in much of the province. We're mainly seeing that to the southeast still today. Our friends there are being met with temperatures in the 30s, once again, feeling closer to 40 because of the humidex. Now, let's take a look at our temperatures for today. We're seeing much cooler conditions in the north. Um, we felt that cooler air coming in these past few days, and we're still seeing that today. Now, as we head down into south and central, that's when we're seeing a bit more seasonal temperatures to the west. We're seeing daytime highs around 25 degrees, and of course, down in the southeast where we're seeing those extreme heat warnings still. We're seeing temperatures in the 30s and with that humidex across most of South and Central, still seeing temperatures in the 30s because of that humidex. But to the Southwest, we're still seeing temperatures in the 20s. So we're getting a bit of everything, including some severe thunderstorm watches and warnings. We can see that traveling through the Southeast right now. We've been getting that throughout much of the afternoon, and we could still see that as we head into tonight as well. Now, looking ahead, we're going to see those showers pass through some more, and as we head into tomorrow, we're still going to be met with some severe weather, looking at possible thunderstorms throughout central Saskatchewan. Heading into Sunday, we're going to get another big push of severe weather move through south and central, and that's going to bring some thunderstorms along with it as well. Now, we've been dealing with these smoky conditions throughout most of the north because of those wildfires that have been burning. And because of that, we're seeing special air quality statements in effect. And this smoke does seem like it's going to stay with us for the next few days to come. Now, let's take a look at our seven-day forecast here. Seeing seasonal temperatures tomorrow with daytime highs around 25 degrees. But, of course, with that humidex, it's still going to feel like 30 here in Regina, in the high 30s, actually. As we head further into the week ahead, we're still going to be met with those seasonal temperatures. But then we could see more heat warnings pop up later on on next week because we're going to see those temperatures drop back creep back into the 30s once again for daytime highs and over in saskatoon as well once again feeling that cooler air move in through central areas of the province. But as we head into next week, once again, we're going to see those daytime highs get back into the 30s in a lot of areas, feeling closer to 40 with the humidex. So we're done with the heat right now, Dan, but I think it's going to start to come back in again. 
So a little bit more of a bearable weekend. Do you have any Saskatchewan adventures this weekend planned? Not really. Should I? I think you should, okay. especially with how nice it is. We'll work on that then. All right. The annual Running of the Bulls in Pamplona, Spain is an event packed with color and spectacle as well as chance. And for the runners taking part, the adrenaline rush was as big as the 600 kilogram bulls chasing them through the streets. As always, there were injuries, medics reporting three people requi requiring hospital treatment, including one gored in the armpit. The festival continues until Sunday. We'll be back after the break. The first Indigenous person to appear on a Major League Baseball roster was Louis Sokalexis. He played over a century ago for the Cleveland Spiders. It's been 100 years and Indigenous people are still breaking through barriers on the diamond. CBC Indigenous producer Brian Ineas has more. For the North End legends from Winnipeg, baseball is a family affair. Corey Raven's grandfather founded the North End Legends decades ago. Now, he manages the team that features relatives who live in the city. And it's an important way for Corey to stay connected to the man who inspired his love of the diamond. It makes me proud, you know, just knowing my grandfather's up there watching us, still playing ball. I'm a little older now these days, but I still try and still play, and I actually get to enjoy my kids playing ball. And, um, Seeing my team playing ball every time we hit the field is just great, great, great feeling. But Indigenous people's history in baseball stretches back a long time. Break as Gene Hurst third with a spectacular slide. Way back in 1947, Jackie Robinson broke Major League Baseball's color barrier when he became the first black man to play professional baseball for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Robinson with the run that beats the Yanks. You would just like to say that I was really just a spoke in the wheel of the success that we had some 25 years ago. But another spoke in the wheel of success is Lewis Sock Alexis, who actually debuted about 50 years before Robinson did. He was from the Penobscot Indian tribe in Maine. And all accounts published in the newspapers of the day show Sock Alexis was a heck of a baseball player, even before he went pro. A newspaper clipping from the Boston Post Sun recounted one game from the summer of 1895, when Sock Alexis chased after a line drive that was hit into left field. The ball hit the ground so far from home plate, it would have been an easy home run for the Harvard team if Sock Alexis wasn't the player chasing the ball down. Roughly two years later, Sock Alexis was approached by the ownership of the Cleveland Spiders, and he signed a major league contract. His rookie season saw the most success. He hit 338 with three home runs and nine triples, while stealing 16 bases over just 66 games. 2-2 to Daniels, strike three call. But over 125 years after Sock Alexis' debut, Indigenous baseball players are still breaking through barriers. In 2023, Caleb Thomas from Six Nations was the first Indigenous player named to Baseball Canada's junior national roster. One, two pitch here, check swing and... Thomas says he wants to pitch in the major leagues one day. He's currently playing for the NCAA Division I Missouri State Bears. My involvement with baseball started ever since I could walk. It's been like my whole life and I've used it as a platform to like be a role model for the younger generation and use it like to motivate other kids to play any sports, whether that be baseball, lacrosse, whatever it may be. I found it just use my platform to just promote healthy being and just being active and following dreams. One thing that Thomas says he's learned in his years playing baseball, the amount of indigenous talent that exists in the game today. I didn't realize there were so many like talented other indigenous baseball players who deserve the chance to be looked at and recognized. And I just think baseball is growing more and more each year in the indigenous communities. And I, I think it's like wonderful to see that. I know like uh, hockey and lacrosse are the biggest sports, but I think it's just great to see there's people 
expanding their horizons and trying other sports and hopefully making a name for themselves one day. A list created by Baseball Almanac, which compiles baseball stats, facts, and history, shows just 52 Native Americans played in the major leagues, including Sauk Alexis. But like Thomas, more are trying to get there. Winnipeg's Bryce Raven from Broken Head Ojibwe Nation in Manitoba is one of them. He participated in the most recent North American Indigenous Games with Team Manitoba and brought back the gold medal in the under-19 category. Bryce knows one of his favorite players, former Boston Red Sox and New York Yankee Jacoby Ellsbury, identifies as Native American. Bryce and Ellsbury are both natural left-handers. And Bryce says he hopes to one day play in the major leagues like Ellsbury did. I want to go to college somewhere. I hope when I go back to juniors and after this season, I hope to get offers as, as far as it takes me. Like if it's done after college and just come back and play with family again. Bryce says he thinks a good way for the game to grow among Indigenous people is seeing more events like training camps hosted on reserve or in Indigenous communities. Three cheers. For Bryce, baseball is a passion with potential to be so much more if he's willing to put the work into it. It's a great feeling and it's it's something that he needs to do is uh, kind of break away from the family team, Northern Legends, which is something he needs to do. Get back into school, get get back into the college and start playing hard, hardball again and get, a, get away from this game right now, back into the AAA hardball and college ball. And it's it, it's kind of a good feeling, but a little sad because he's got to go away. Corey says he's sad he may not play baseball with his son anymore on the North End Legends, but he's happy to see him become a legend in his own right, alongside other indigenous trailblazers like Sock Alexis. Brian Enius, CBC Indigenous, Winnipeg. Tyreek's back with another look at the weather and with how wet it was in the spring and how hot it's been lately. I'm surprised extreme weather hasn't popped up as much as it has. But as I was thinking of it, guess what happens? Exactly, Dan. Now we are seeing that extreme weather environment. Canada just issued a tornado warning for the RM of Waverly further down south near the U.S. border. Of course, this replaces a severe thunderstorm warning that was issued earlier. So we're going to get a lot of strong winds in the area and heavy rain. We'll keep you all updated on how that turns out. And of course, we'll be tracking the system as it heads east throughout the night. Now let's take a look at our overnight forecast right here in Regina. We're seeing mainly clear skies heading into tomorrow morning. We're still going to be met with much cooler conditions to start our day. Lots of sunshine as we head into the afternoon. We're still going to be met with more seasonal temperatures. Finally, not feeling that heat in Saskatoon as well. Lots of clear skies tonight. As we wake up tomorrow morning, much cooler temperatures to start our day and we'll be seeing seasonal temperatures at around 25 degrees for daytime highs tomorrow. Dan? All right. Thanks, Tariq. No problem. And that's it for us tonight. And that's it for me this week. Ethan Williams will be back next week. So thank you for having me at your home and on your phones. And of course, anytime you need news, check our website at cbc.ca slash sask. I hope everybody has a great and safe weekend. Good night.